So hello everyone and welcome. So thank you for joining me in the uh, stream today. Uh, today we're gonna be talking about this really quirky and unusual instrument. So you don't see a lot of these here in the United States. Uh, most of them are bought from uh, places such as Hungary or Romania where they're more popular. This is a tarogato. So what exactly is a tarogato? Well, that's a really good question. So when you ask somebody what a tarogato is, the most common answer you're gonna get is it's simply a wooden soprano saxophone, and it's partially true. It is kind of like a saxophone in that it uses a single reed mouthpiece. It has a conical bore, so unlike a clarinet, it overblows at the octave. And it has a fairly uh, simple system of cue work, very similar to Albert's system clarinets. But um, fundamentally, it is different from the saxophone in that it has smaller tone folds in a German system cube work. And that's really the uh, thing that makes the Targata unique. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm gonna guess that it's just a European clarinet sack. Yeah, kind of. I mean, the, the history of the Targato is, um, it kind of, its heyday was really in the early 20th century, late 19th century. So the instrument was, uh, just to give a quick history, it was invented in uh, Hungary uh, by a man named uh, Joseph Schunda, and I'm probably butchering that name. Um, and actually, he submitted a patent for the instrument, um, and then somebody else submitted a patent for a very similar instrument almost a day later, and uh, that man was uh, Mr. Stoesser. And he was a, a pretty well-known manufacturer of woodwind and brass instruments in Hungary at the time, and uh, both of them kind of made instruments up until around World War I, uh, Stoesser's factory burned down. Um, and then the instrument kind of fell into obscurity until um, it's just starting to be revived today. Uh, in places like Romania and Hungary, the instrument did kind of hold on and it was uh, fairly popular in folk music. But uh, now we're starting to see a bit of a resurgence in this instrument. We actually have a few uh, modern manufacturers such as uh, Stefan Fox and uh, I believe um, Hammerschmidt, a, a German clarinet manufacturer also makes these instruments too. So we are starting to see a bit of a little bit of a rebirth of this instrument. So this instrument in particular is one I actually found on uh, eBay um, from Germany. So it was mislabeled as a clarinet, and that's the only reason I found it, because I generally just kind of search clarinet on eBay and just kind of see what's out there and see if I see any good deals. And this, uh, it was mislabeled as a clarinet, and surprisingly, very few people uh, bid on it. I think by the end of the uh, auction, there's only like four bids on it. So I was able to snag it up for, I think, a total, including shipping and tax, it was about 120 bucks. Uh, generally, even the cheapest, uh, uh, really poorly made targatos generally sell for upwards of five hundred dollars. So for one hundred and twenty bucks, I'm, I'm totally happy with that. So as you can see, this thing has definitely seen better days. So um, just in general, the instrument is a lot less complicated than, uh, let's say, a sax or even more modern targatos have more cuber than this. So. Um, it just has the bare bones basic keys you would need to play a chromatic scale. And in fact, there's even a few fingerings that you have to use cross fingerings for because they're just not a key to play that note. For example, the C, you have to kind of finger it like you would on a tin whistle where you do like a lift your first finger and then you use your uh, second and third finger to play that note. So uh, yeah, it's a very simple uh, instrument, mostly designed for a folk music, but it's very strange and quirky. And it's a, I think it's a very interesting and unique instrument. Um, I've actually, this isn't my first Targato, so I've had two of them in the past. Those were, um, they were cheaper Romanian instruments. So after uh, the, the Stoesser factory burned down, um, Romania, uh, several factories in Romania started copying the Stoesser design. And uh, while the Stoesser instruments were okay, they're not, by modern standards, they weren't great, but they were pretty good. Um, the Romanian instruments are just absolutely terrible. And I think that's uh, led to part of the poor reputation of the Targato we see today. Um, but uh, yeah, so I had two of those and they were just very, very poor craftsmanship. And I think this instrument is also pretty uh, pretty terrible. As you're gonna see, there's some really weird uh, quirks and like some very bad design flaws on this instrument. Uh, but for $120, I can't complain. So without further ado, let's just uh, dive into this instrument. So. 
if you were following my Instagram, you probably know that I changed the um, the mouthpiece receiver from one that would accept the soprano sax mouthpiece. Um, and the reason I did that is because these instruments generally use their own uh, custom Targato mouthpiece. And unfortunately, most of the ones that originally came with the instruments are long since uh, been beaten and battered and destroyed. And I, I don't know if I have, I think, I think I have a hand. So this is the mouthpiece that came with it, and you can tell it's got a big chip in it. But not only that, uh, the whole facing is just completely uh, chewed up and destroyed, so that's no good. So, um, so I got nominated for Honors Man. Nice, congratulations. Only bassoonist out of 120 kids. Sweet, nice job. Um, so yeah, as I was saying, so the, the mouthpiece, uh, it was just absolutely uh, battered. And the problem with uh, Targato mouthpieces is uh, most, you can't just go to, down to your local mouthpiece maker and say, hey, make me a Targato mouthpiece. They're gonna say, what? Um, because every, not only is the, uh, the the standard mouthpiece design for Targato very different than, say, for example, a saxophone, um, also, Individual Targatos use different mouthpieces, so a mouthpiece from one instrument is not going to fit necessarily fit another instrument, even really from the same manufacturer. Um, a Targato is an instrument where you have to have a mouthpiece matched to the instrument. Now, in the saxophone world, we have it pretty easy comparatively. Um, I can just uh, take a soprano sax mouthpiece, and there's a pretty good chance that it's going to work on most instruments. So what I did was I made this uh, adapter that allows me to uh, put a standard soprano sax mouthpiece which if you actually look at the uh, chambers of the mouthpieces, they're very, very close. And in fact, the, uh, the bore inside is, or, well, so the, the bore of this mouthpiece is roughly the same as the, uh, the very like beginning uh, bore section of a soprano saxophone. So it's actually really easy to make just an adapter just to fit a standard soprano saxophone mouthpiece on it. And now I don't have to go searching for a custom mouthpiece. So that's a, one little quick thing I did. Um, so yeah, so now at least um, after that, I fixed a really long crack. There was a crack about, um, it went all the way pretty much through the entire upper joint. Have you thought about making your own Targato? I have in the past and I've, I've tried before, but it never really came out really well. I think my next attempt, what I wanna do is I wanna kind of copy this instrument and maybe make a, a 3D printed version like in sections. I think I'm gonna do like two inches at a time and then just glue them together because uh, oh. As you can see, this instrument is missing a lot of keys. Um, some of them I have, some of them I don't, but the cool thing about Targato is you can actually do a lot of the same uh, fingerings that you would normally use on a recorder. So what I would think would be really cool is a Targato that didn't have any keys and it was just kind of cross-fingered like a recorder. I think maybe one key I could just have with just a simple register key like you would see on a clarinet, but I think that would be a pretty cool instrument to make. I'm surprised nobody's really made anything like that. Oh, darn. Oh, hopefully you get that back soon. Okay, yeah, let me play a little bit of music on it. It is a, um, so they, because the Targato has uh, smaller tone holes and uh, it, it kind of has a, um, I guess what contributes most of the sound is kind of the roughness of the bore. So compared to the polished metal bore of a saxophone, it, um, it sounds a lot more uh, reedy, a lot more, uh, it's kind of hard to describe. Let me just play a few notes for you. So, um, one nice. So, one uh, weird quirk about this instrument that I've really never seen is that usually these things have like at least one or two octave keys. Um, this doesn't have any octave keys whatsoever. So if you're trying to overblow in this thing, um, what I like to do is I just kind of like to uncover the very top of the highest tone hole. And that kind of gives me a, um, lets me play in the upper register, but it's really flat because it's not acoustically correct. And then you see, I really can't play anything above maybe a G and even anything up to that is iffy. Uh, yeah, so one of the cool things about this is um, since the dimensions are roughly the same as the clarinet, I'm going to just try and put a, a clarinet register key on it, and I think that will um, that will help it overblow. 
Yeah, basically, and this instrument, I don't I don't know why it's designed like that, because the whole point of the Targato is it overblows at the octave, so you'd think you'd want a register key there, but yeah, um, in order to even play, even have any even attempt to play in the upper register, you kind of have to have all. Yeah, so exactly, just like that, uh, the bassoon, uh, you can, so the bassoon fingering would just be to lift that finger up, if I'm not mistaken, and that doesn't, doesn't really work on a... It kind of works if you like trick it, but it doesn't work perfectly. So yeah, you kind of have to like half hold and just leave a little bit of that hole open. Um, soprano. Okay, so the interesting thing about this was the uh, the original manufacturer of the tar Targato, Joseph Schunda. Um, he designed an instrument that has a bore that's slightly less uh, tapered than the saxophone, but the more modern uh, Stoicer design had pretty much exactly the same bore as the soprano saxophone. So the, the soprano saxophones pretty much all have a taper of uh, three degrees. Um, so pretty much it's the same bore, but the tone holes, because they're smaller, they got to be higher up. So um, yeah, it kind of changes the acoustics of the instrument a little bit. And it means, unlike a saxophone, you can do things like uh, cross fingering, you can do half holings. So um, theoretically, at least, if you had like a Targato with a full set of like key work, um, the fact that you could half hold could theoretically mean you can play really easily into the upper altissimo uh, without too much issue. Unfortunately, I haven't really seen any like uh, targatos with like, like palm keys and stuff like that. I think that would be a, a more modern targato with the modern keys you would expect on a saxophone. It would be a pretty cool thing for um, artists and stuff like that. Yeah. Register keys make everything airy. If, yeah, so. With the Targato, um, if they're poorly designed, like a lot of the remaining instruments are, a lot of times the, they're just copied off of uh, Stoicers without really care for the design. So a lot of times the register uh, vents or the octave vents end up in the wrong locations. So a lot of like the remaining Targatos, they, they won't play very well in the upper register. They'll sound very airy, uh, out of you know, poor intonation. Um, so I made it to do a little bit of experimenting, finding the correct uh, register or octave tube location on this instrument. But uh, the instrument's already pretty beat up anyway, so I don't, I don't mind you know, mind drilling a few holes in it. Uh, so going further on the instrument, just some of its uh, quirks and features. So um, it's it has uh, string tenons. Uh, that's pretty typical to see on older instruments like this. Although uh, Targato, as you saw, string tenons well into the 20th century, where the only instrument you really saw that on is bassoons. Everything else was pretty much switched to cork by that point. Uh, the keys, so... Um, normally when you have like a clarinet key, there's a, a screw, a threaded rod that you use to screw in the key. Uh, this instrument just pretty much has these uh, pins, which is something you saw on a lot of like older 18th century instruments. So what I mean by that is, I don't know if I can get it out, but essentially it's just like a, this won't come out. So like this key. So essentially it would just be like a, like a metal pin that just simply slides in there. This is like an, a replacement pin I'm trying to make, but it, it would just slide in there and there's really no threading or anything holding that on, which means that the keys uh, on these, um, they have the potential to fall out just because there's nothing really holding that uh, pin in besides the tension of the key. So um, not a great design. It, it can work if it's well-made, but unfortunately this instrument is just far from well-made. I could never, I tried, the one time I tried playing fluid, I, I just could not get that third octave to sound good. I, I don't know, I just don't like third. I, I prefer the lower register of the fluid. Does it have an attachable bell? Yeah, so the bell, um, it's kind of just like any uh, Targato bell. Well, the weird thing is most of these instruments have a range to low B flat. They'll have like a thumb key. This one does not, And uh, but it was designed off an instrument, it was copied off an instrument that did, so... You can see the hole for B flat is there, and if I were to like cover that with tape, I could and play a low B, I could play a B flat. But it's kind of annoying that that key's not there because it means like a, I'm just missing a whole note from the range of the instrument. Uh, so other quirks, yeah. So um, the the fit and finish is just absolutely terrible. So um, so the the, uh, the the diameter of the tubes used in the construction of these keys is um, is much larger than the pins used to hold them in, uh, and what that means is that there's so much slop in the action. So for example, this key, I can just move it back and forth. And the only thing that's allowed me to do that is just the slop in the action. So that's uh, pretty bad to see. So what I'm gonna probably have to do is change all the pins out for ones of the appropriate diameter. And another really weird 
work about this instrument. Normally with like clarinet posts, they're kind of like this rounded shape sitting on top of a cone. But uh, these posts are just pretty much just straight pieces of straight rods of metal that are rounded off a bit in the top and holes drilled in them. They're, this instrument is extremely crude and rough, uh, and there's just a lot of weird things about it. Um, are you going to make new? Yeah, I'm going to try and make as many uh, uh, replacement keys. Um, although I was kind of thinking what might be cool is to actually take a lot of the keys off since they're not really great to begin with and kind of make a keyless uh, instrument. I thought that would be kind of cool, but maybe I'll, I'll save that for making a homemade instrument and just try to get this instrument as restored as I possibly can given the, uh, the poor construction. You can get that low knob like knee knob, tone hole like you would do on beginner oboe model that goes to a low B flat by covering them by tension. Yeah, exactly. Um, so that, yeah, that's pretty much what you have to do. You kind of have to put the bell so the hole is facing that way and then just close it off with your knee. Although not very practical in terms of, uh, like if, if you're standing, you, you kind of have to, you kind of have to like awkwardly like play like this and it just looks really silly. So <laughs> probably just better to play that note up the octave. Um, so other things, uh, yeah, just the general fit and finish is, not as good as you would expect, but the thing of Targatos is, um, in general, none of them are really very well made. I mean, the uh, the best of the best is probably the uh, the Stoicers, but even those are they're not the best um, compared to like a slightly more modern clarinet. It would be pretty primitive, um, and that's just kind of a thing with Targatos. Uh, except for probably, I think that the two exceptions of that would be the new uh, Stefan Fox instruments and the instruments made by a hammersmith. Have you ever machined a clarinet from scratch entirely? Um, not really like a, what you consider like a modern, like professionally built clarinet. Like I have made my, like for example, my PVZ bass and horns, and of course the octo contra clarinets. Um, no, I, I've, I've thought about it. Uh, I'm probably going to one day when I get better equipment, like my lathe is only equipped for joints that are eight inches long. So there's not really much I could build with it. Like I thought um, maybe I'd, the first thing I'd probably build is like a piccolo clarinet. I actually have some um, custom machine Delrin tubes in case I want to build it, but I just haven't really started yet. It's something I want to do in the future though. Speaking uh, now, I don't really have any updates. Unfortunately, I haven't made much progress. I'm still going to get some, um, I got to order some more brass and some more uh, couplings. And I've worked, I've just been kind of lazy and I just haven't gotten to that. I think I'll, I'll try and pick up on it soon. Unfortunately, I just kind of had, other projects and stuff in the meantime. But uh, anyway, back to the Targato. So yeah, so it's missing quite a few keys. Uh, the hardest one to build is probably gonna be this ring key. And normally what I do when I build keys is I kind of steal as many parts off of other instruments like clarinets as possible. And because these tonals are so wide, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to use the rings from a clarinet key, I'm probably have to make my own. So that's gonna involve maybe having some uh, some pieces of a raw uh, sheet. Uh, nickel uh, machined out into the right shape. So that's going to be kind of hard to find. But uh, I'll probably figure that out. I've been designing a wind instrument recently using a conical bore. I'm having a hard time figuring out how to machine it. Um, yeah, so machining a conical bore is probably one of the more difficult uh, parts of making a, a woodwind instrument. So there's, there's several ways to do it. So the, the easiest probably is to, um, so let's say you have your, yeah, so here we go. So let's say you have your uh, piece of wood. So um, what you're wanting to do is find a lathe with a, a boring attachment, and you're going to want to bore a hole all the way through it. So the diameter of the hole should be the uh, the same as the diameter at the top of your instrument. So like when I say that, I mean like the diameter closest to the mouthpiece. And then what you're going to do is you're going to want to make a piece of like tapered uh, a tapered. So you just the obvious standpoint is get some like a eighth inch thick uh, sheet uh, steel, um, probably like a bar about maybe let's say three or four inches wide, depending on what you want to build. And then you're just going to like cut the, sh the profile of the bore. So you're going to probably use like an angle grinder and cut, cut make like a, a triangular shape out of that metal. And then you're going to want to sharpen both edges. And then you're going to kind of use that to ream out the bore to make your conical shape. And that's probably the easiest way to do it. That's how most um, uh, shams, older, like shams, older oboes are manufactured. Um, it's still a little bit technically challenging, but it's fairly doable if you want to make your own kind of like conical wind instrument. A piccolo piccolo would be very, very nice to as a collection. I don't know. I couldn't. Like, for example, here's my, uh, here's the flagiola that I bought today. 
Like this is basically just like a piccolo with a, a fiddle mouthpiece. Like even then, my fingers are pretty close. Imagine half that size. I don't think there's any way I could fit my fingers in that. <laughs> even more years will be, yeah, that too. Have you had any experience with 3D printers? You could print out the keys you need and use uh, plastic castings to make metal parts. I do have pretty uh, plenty of experience actually with uh, with 3D printers. So I kind of got I got one. I got into 3D printing in like 2012. I kind of got what it was like, it was like a printer bought simple. So this this basic three hundred dollar printer, and then I kind of I, I used it to make my own like uh, homemade instruments stuff like that parts, uh, and then I got a job. Uh, at my local college, or actually not the college I went to, but in my local college, yeah, um, working in their 3D printer lab. So I got tons of experience with like MakerBots and stuff, and I've tried using it to make like uh, mouthpieces, instruments, and stuff. And in general, I just found that it's a lot easier to machine the parts out by hand than it is to 3D print them in most cases. I think maybe the exception would be um, like an instrument like this where it's a conical board. It's probably easier to um, make 3D print the pieces, but yeah, I don't know. I might I might get my 3D printer up and running again and try making some more stuff. The technology has actually improved quite a bit. Uh, back when I started, we only really had the option of ABS plastic or PLA, and neither of those plastics were really suitable for an instrument, but now we have stuff like PETG, carbon fiber, nylon. So, um, yeah, it might, now that technology is getting better, it might actually be more practical to make instruments out of uh, 3, or 3D print instruments. My first idea was to make a stepped octagon shape out of wood in the general shape of my taper. Yeah, that's also another way to do it. Another thing you could do, um, I forget where I saw this, but somebody made a saxophone where it was just, um, it was flat. So it was like two triangular pieces of wood. Um, and then uh, like they made a box shape out of it. So like one side was uh, was uh, was pretty much uh, like a straight parallel and, and the um, it's basically tapered it's kind of hard to describe, but it was kind of like a triangular shape, and that was enough to create like the proper taper so that it overblowed at the octave. Um, so that was that's one way you could do it. Um, something like the, uh, the the box occlide, like the uh, the the wooden ophicleide, um, where it's just four pieces of wood making a taper. That would also probably work too. Um, my next idea was the 3D printed section and the resin cast it. Yeah, that's one way to do it. Um, I don't know. I don't like resin casting too much. I've never really I don't have too much experience with it, but I, I don't know. I just didn't, it, it doesn't seem appealing to me for manufacturing purposes. Um, what would a clarinet sound like if it was conical instead of a cylindrical? Pretty much exactly like a, a Targato, because that's essentially what the design is. It's If you were to take away the, um, the cylindrical bore and make it, uh, or if you take away the conical bore and make it cylindrical, uh, you would basically have a, a clarinet. It, of course, if you had to add more keys. Um, well, the registry you go to the 12th. And now, it would, so yeah, anytime an instrument is conical, it's going to overblow with the octave just because it kind of simulates an open uh, height. Um, like a very long, yeah, like an elongated pyramid, exactly. We're talking about 3D printed instruments. I'm printing a serpent. I also made a box of glide. Awesome. Yeah, I saw Richard Bobo's 3D printed serpent, and it was, uh, it was pretty interesting. Um, Anyway, I should probably, I guess I should start <laughs> working on this instrument. Um, I don't know why it blocked your message for some reason. That was weird. Okay. The main issue is that there would be at least four sections, including the boot joint, which would definitely be a pain in the ass to manufacture. Yeah. I don't know. I, it, it, I mean, instrument manufacture is such an interesting thing, and yet it's so, it's so difficult for like hobbyists like us to get into it. Um, like it's easy, pretty easy to make like simple tin whistles and stuff, but anything more complicated, you kind of have to have equipment and machinery. Uh, so anyway, what I'm going to do to start fixing this instrument is the first thing I'm probably going to tackle is this, uh, this socket. It is pretty cracked up and, um, destroyed. So unfortunately I'm going to have to see if I can, uh, kind of glue the pieces back together, see if I can get it solid and then, um, have some reinforcement, maybe like a carbon fiber band, and then I'll put the ring over that. And that should be, I think, solid enough to um, make it play properly because right now it's kind of leaking through that. And right now I'm just going to try and get some of the keys off just so I can kind of access that, uh, that socket. And this thing looks like it really took, a, uh, took some damage over the years. So this, this is supposed to be, a, I don't know if you can see that, but that's supposed to be straight. So that's... 
that's not good. Um, okay, so got those two keys off. Um, and one thing interesting to note is the um, the pads on this instrument, even though they're like the technology to make pad cups have had existed probably when this Targato was made. Uh, the pads are the old like dish style pads that you see in a lot of like early mid 18th century or 19th century clarinets. Uh, Targatos by nature are very primitive. They, they really didn't, you didn't really see them like catch up with the technology of the time that they were made. Um, which kind of, it's kind of difficult when you're, I mean, this instrument, I mean, they were made to the point where they're uh, the latest ones coming from Stoviser were less than a hundred years old. Well, I guess the factory burned out in like 1917. So the new, the latest ones would just be turning hundred years old. And yet they're pretty much, they have the same technology as clarinets that are 150 years old. Um, so it's kind of uh, one thing you need to pretty much accept when you're, when you uh, want to fix or play a Targato that it's going to be a primitive instrument by design. Man, I got a question. Do you think it would be odd to have more than one bass clarinet in a wind ensemble? Uh, definitely not. Um, even in my, uh, my like, uh, middle of nowhere high school um, concert band with only like, it was like 40 players. We still had two bass clarinets, me and somebody else. So I think the more bass clarinets you have, it's going to add a lot to your uh, your lower woodwinds, which is uh, you really, besides the bass clarinets, you only really have a very sax and most uh, simpler wind ensembles. Especially my, my, uh, my concert band didn't even have any bassoons or anything. <laughs> bass clarinet, <game, laughs> that's yeah, I absolutely love the bass clarinet. It's my definitely my favorite instrument. Uh, I think it's very underutilized. I mean, I think a lot more. Uh, there's nothing wrong with having like as many three or four bass clarinets. Why not? I mean, all it's going to do is add to your sound, especially if you've already got like uh, tons of clarinets. Might as well move some of them to lower instruments. That's uh, okay. So we got. And I guess that's all the keys off the instrument. Okay. So I'm just going to kind of put those to the side and I'm going to try and get this a little bit cleaned up because it's got like a hundred years of crud on it. Um, these corners are like the best and they can get covered by other instruments. Um, yeah, I think the ba bass clarinet is a general, very uh, practical instrument. I mean, look at, look at it compared to other instruments in its uh with the similar pitch, like the Barry Sachs, it has a huge range. You're talking over four octaves for an experienced player. Um, it's got a good dynamic range. They can play play fairly loudly. Obviously, not as loud as a sax, but um, fairly loud. Uh, they're very practical instruments, and it's too bad they're not more utilized. Um, the clarinet family, as a whole, other things are very underutilized. Would it be odd to have more than one contralto, contrabass, or octo? Um, depending on the situation. I think in most cases, uh, well, if you have a big ensemble, yeah, it makes a lot of sense to have more contrabass clarinets. Um, but if your ensemble is only like, let's say, 50 players large, I think one contrabass clarinet might even be enough, especially if you have a heavy um, low sax and the low brass section. Are B-flat clarinets and alto? Yeah, or, yeah, I play bass clarinet as well. Are bassoon player in the very... Good. So my has me playing bassoon parts while their bass clarinet plays the bass clarinet part, which is annoying. Yeah, that's weird. Usually the parts are, especially in like uh, um, simpler music, the the bass clarinet and the bassoons often like double each other. Uh, our B B flat clarinets actually an alto instrument. So B flat clarinets um, they they cover such a wide range, like almost three and a half four octaves potentially, that it's really hard to say they're specifically an alto instruments. They can cover the soprano register, register and the alto register just as easily. So there's no reason you can't have, um, it's not necessarily just an alto instrument. I would say uh, it tends more towards the soprano because clarinets are generally optimized to play in the upper register. Uh, so uh, that's where they, they really shine. So um, for alto instruments, probably more of like the uh, like a G clarinet would be a better alto clarinet. Average orchestra needs at least four octave conscious. I wish. I wish they were that common. I wouldn't have to make my own. <laughs> okay, so anyway, uh, so I just kind of cleaned this up uh, with some isopropyl alcohol. Um, I got most of the gunk off there. So what I'm just going to do is I'm going to take a little bit of um, a CA glue, some super glue, 
And I'm just going to kind of touch up on, put little dots on the outside of each crack and let it fill in. And normally what I would do is I would put the glue on another surface and use like a needle or something to apply it. But in this case, since I'm, um, I'm just gluing where the ring's gonna go, you won't really see any excess glue. And actually a little bit of excess glue will be good because it'll add a little space between this ring and this tenon. So I'm just gonna have a little bit of excess glue on the outside where you won't be able to see it and where it can add a little bit more strength. So let me just touch up some of those cracks. And actually there's a lot of places on this instrument where um, there's like a lot of wood chips and there's actually a few holes in the instrument which I'm weren't filled, which I'm not sure why. So I kind of, um, it's in the upper joint, I kind of just filled in some uh, of the imperfections of the wood with super glue and wood dust and just kind of tried to rebuild it as best I can. Uh, the bore still isn't very good, but um, I mean, I don't think this instrument was ever good or ever will be good. I'm just going to try and get it as good as it can be. And again, that's fairly typical in the Targata world. Even the best of the best is still not great. Um, but we'll see how this instrument comes out. Eventually, what I really like to do is try and make like a really well-made, well-manufactured Targato. Um, Something with like a burn system keywork, I think would be pretty pretty cool and practical. Um, I know like a, there's a new company, so Stoa, sir, I mentioned before, um, they're not around anymore, but there's a, uh, I guess a manufacturer kind of took their name and they're making instruments that based off the original and they make this instrument called like a, a golden voice. Like I guess that's the model name that was, uh, it's like Coca Bolo and it's got like gold keys and burn system key work and like automatic octave vents, everything you could possibly want. I'd be really curious to try it, but unfortunately they're, they're quite expensive and I, don't know, I just couldn't justify spending that much money on an instrument that I never really play that much. Okay, so I kind of went around and I glued all the spots where there were cracks. And fortunately, it doesn't look like any of the cracks really extended into the um, very far into the body instrument. So I don't really need to do any refinishing or anything. I don't. I can just leave it as is. Um, so what I'm going to do now, because the I wish bassoon had a good and sensible key system, but I don't want to lose its time. But yeah, that's kind of the problem with bassoon. I mean, there have been attempts to make a more modern bassoons, but a lot of them have not been met very well. Um, I forget what it's called, but somebody made like this improved bassoon system where there was two extra octave vents that allowed it to play in the upper register uh, more cleanly. Um, but that didn't catch on, unfortunately. I mean, I think just to make a better bassoon, I, you kind of just need to add more vents. That's really all it needs. But it's kind of hard to devise a system where it doesn't involve like switching between a ton of register keys all the time. Uh, I mean, obviously, with bassoon, you have the whisper key, but it's really not enough to to make the bassoon play really well in the upper register. Um, okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm gonna add kind of a spacer in between the ring and the, um, the, the wooden body of the instrument. Uh, so what I usually do for this, um, what is this talent? Yeah, um, well, that's kind of the thing with the bassoon. It's Sorry. Um, yeah, most of the tone comes from the fact that it has smaller tonals and a very narrow bore. It gives it a very distinct tone from something like, for example, the uh, the heckle phone, where it's got a much wider bore and larger, more acoustically optimized tonals. Um, so yeah, it's kind of unfortunate that when you try to improve the instrument, you kind of take it away from what it is. Um, yeah, so I don't think I don't know if we'll ever see an improved bassoon, but. I know, it's kind of unfortunate that the student's kind of like the least developed instrument, modern orchestral instrument. So anyway, I'm gonna what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take like a piece of plastic uh, film, some uh, lucite film, and I'm gonna uh, squeeze it in between the ring and the wooden body, and that'll compress the wood and make sure those cracks don't open up again. So let me just grab some of the film. What I'm using is um, it's just a uh, it's just spare pieces of plastic from like plastic wrappings and stuff. Uh, it's it's this plastic called lucite, so it's like this. You, you know what it is because it's it, whenever you like uh, crinkle it, it makes a really loud sound. So the nice thing about lucite is it doesn't really compress a lot, 
So it's good for like a wedging image for um, for long. It's good for a wedging ring so that they don't move. Um, so if you have like a clarinet with loose rings, this is like the procedure you would use to tighten them properly without uh, making any permanent modifications like gluing. So in this case, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to fold it over twice and maybe even three times because this ring is really, really loose. Hmm. Okay, so I got my piece of plastic. I'm going to put it over the uh, the socket, and I'm going to take my ring, and I'm going to put that over the plastic, so that you can kind of see it's like um, it's like wedged over there, kind of like a, the skin of a drum. So now I'm going to take my uh, my knife, and I'm just going to cut away the excess plastic. And I want to do this carefully so that I don't hurt myself or damage the instrument. Do you have any plans to sell similar horns on eBay? Yeah, I actually, uh, I sell uh, horns on eBay on a pretty regular basis. Uh, I think my username is JD Woodwinds. Um, so yeah, if you ever want to check it out, I do. I don't think I have a lot now. I have a, like a barrel and I take a few spare parts. But sometimes I do sell some of my instruments on eBay. So I'm just going to go around and I'm just going to kind of cut off. Let me, let me bend down so you can see what I'm doing. So I'm just cutting off the excess plastic. Um, very carefully so that none of it is showing when this uh, is complete. Okay. Okay, almost there. Okay, so I cut all the excess plastic off the uh, the outside of the ring. So now it looks clean. There's nothing excess showing, so that looks good. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut off the inside. So what I like to do is I just like to kind of pop it with a knife, and then uh, I'll fold it back, and I can kind of like uh, tear a little bit off just to get started, and then just um, keep tearing around. And it generally likes to tear right where the uh, ring is, so you got there's no excess plastic and uh, if there is a little bit of excess, what you can do is just go back with your knife and just kind of, I know it's kind of hard to see, but I'm just going to like cut off any excess against the uh, ring. Okay, so cut off carefully. And there we go. So now excess plastic is cut off. Yeah, exactly. Um, so now I'm just going to push the ring the rest of the way on. Um, push it on. Okay, so that's good. So now the ring is on. It's nice and solid. It's um, it's not going to fall off. And even if I try to twist it, it really doesn't move at all because it's nice and tight. So that's exactly what we want to see. So a nice tight ring is important because it keeps the uh, the tent, the socket from splitting like it did in this case. Um, where do you get pieces to make the, the keys for your instrument? Uh, good question. So most of the more complicated parts like pad cups and touch pieces and stuff, I just really steal them from other instruments. So I have a lot of like scrap clarinets that I either got for free or just uh, um, I bought like lots of broken clarinets. Um, those are pretty good places to get spare parts. But if you need something like longer rods and stuff, you can just order a nickel silver rod. It's actually very, it's commonly used uh, for making knives. Um, if you ever kind of look like a look at a knife, there's like these little round metal uh they almost look like little buttons on the handle. Those are like rods that they used to hold the handles on. But anyway, they sell nickel silver rod um, that you can use for a instrument manufacturer. It works. It's just the same material. It works just the same. And you can get like a foot of rod. I think the size is like five thirty seconds of an inch. No, maybe I'm not, I'm not sure of the size, but you can get like a foot of rod for like ten bucks, and you can use that to make spare keys. And of course, you can get other shapes. You can get like a flat stock, sheet stock. Um, base, uh, if you do enough searching, you can generally find any shape you need. And then it's just a matter of grinding, cutting, milling, sawing, uh, whatever you need to do to shape the key. And then usually when you want to finish it up, you just use like a rock tumbler or a polishing wheel. And then that's pretty much um, how you make a key. So anyway, the, uh, the, the ring is nice and tight. So, um, and now that I glued the cracks in the socket, hopefully we should get a better seal. So let me see if that plays just a little bit better. Of course, I'll probably have to put back some of the key. Uh, so I mentioned before how these um, these rods tend to fall out. 
Uh, and you can see here, this one was actually just replaced with a, a nail. Um, it's not one of the original rods. It's just like a little nail used to hang up a picture frame. Uh, so that's pretty common with these older instruments. They kind of, parts fall off, but they kind of get fixed any way they can. Um, so I don't have any rod rods of parrots. So I'm just kind of going to put that back right now. And I guess I'll also put back the, uh, the D sharp key so that'll allow me to play just a basic scale. So you can see if that had any improvement on the instrument. Okay, so. You can see I'm kind of, I'm just using, since I don't have the, the key here, I'm just using the recorder fingering of just a two and three. Not perfectly in tune, but it works. And unfortunately, because this, this instrument doesn't have the, uh, normally they have like two, uh, two ring keys up here that make the C and the C sharp both in tune. Uh, because of that, and because I'm using a cross fingering, the, their notes are not really in tune. And again, because I don't have a register key, that upper uh, D also isn't very well in tune. But at least now it played, it's more free blowing and it does play a little bit better. How do you learn how to do instrument repair uh, making? Um, most of what I learned, I kind of just learned from reading forms and uh, watching YouTube videos, really. Uh, and all you really have to do is just kind of get started, just, uh, just buy it or buy or find a cheap clarinet. It doesn't have to be really anything special, just uh, whatever you can find and then just kind of practice fixing it. That's uh, it's pretty much all I did to get started. And I just kept going and going. I kept buying and selling instruments. Uh, and eventually I just kind of got to where I am today just by just, uh, fixing instruments, flipping them. Yeah, it's kind of one of those things that's pretty fun to learn along the way. And, uh, and you can make some money if you get good at it. So yeah, it's a fun hobby to have. Yeah, exactly. Hands-on experience experimentation is definitely the way I learn the best. And I think it's the best kind of method for learning how to do something. Um, and But if you do want to do instrument repair, I wouldn't really necess necessarily recommend starting on like the instrument you play all the time, just in case you don't, you don't want to necessarily mess it up. So it's always good to buy like a junk horn just to practice on. Uh, so anyway, so yeah, it's a little bit more free blowing, I think now that the, uh, the cracks are filled. Um, uh, fortunately, the intonation of this instrument just is not great, and I think that just has to go do with the uh, the poor manufacturing. Uh, some interesting things. Another interesting thing to note: um, the springs on this instrument, the needle springs, are actually just like uh, embedded in the wood of this instrument, and they they kind of just they don't really have any like a uh, spring posts where they fit on the uh, the key so they kind of just like sit underneath it so you can see there's a big like it's, it's kind of hard to see but there's like a big needle sticking out there it's very easy to hit your finger on that and as far as i can tell that's how it's supposed to be so it's just a really bizarre instrument uh, okay so what to do next i guess i can just start cleaning it up a little bit um so let me get some of these keys off let me just do a little bit of cleaning, get some of this gunk off, and then maybe I can start repadding it. Shop for super goodwill. Shop goodwill for super cheap clarinets or apparel. Day. Yeah, goodwill, especially the uh, the goodwill auctions. I haven't used too much, but it looks like there's some pretty good deals on in there, so you can find some pretty cheap clarinets. Other than that, like eBay, um, just search like clarinet and just look for the cheapest option. Usually, it's going to be something like that's uh, an older Chinese student clarinet, which I mean, for repair purposes, it's fine because you, it'll just keep you. All clarinets are pretty much repaired the same way. So even if it's a really poor like Chinese clarinet, it's still a great way to learn how to do repair. Um, so because this body is just so much gunk on it, I think I'm just gonna use a little bit of uh, isopropyl alcohol uh, to clean it. Uh, generally, um, most people have put advice that you're not supposed to use alcohol on wood and it does remove a lot of the oils, but since I'm gonna go back and oil this wood anyway, Alcohol is the best way to remove um, all this built up gunk over the years. Although you generally don't want to do this on anything that's newer than 50 years because uh, um, it does have the potential to dry the wood, but on wood that's already old and dry, it really doesn't matter too much anyway. Uh, so yeah, so I'm just going to kind of go clean up some of this gunk. You can already see how much crud is built up on this instrument. 
And it makes me wonder, like, when the last time this thing was really played? And um, originally, I thought this wood was uh, a grenadilla wood, but it appears to be some kind of like a, some kind of fruit wood, which I guess is pretty common with the uh, targatas. I don't think a lot of them are built with grenadilla wood. Uh, so I'm not going to go crazy cleaning. I'm just going to kind of get it clean enough. Um, then we can start to uh, work on some of the key. Uh, so let's see where to start. So I guess let's start with the uh, alternate F key. Uh, so I'm just going to use a clarinet pad. And hopefully I can just do the same procedure that I would normally do for a... Well, first let me straighten this rod a little bit, even though it's... This is the one that's just like a, a nail, but uh, I'll use it for now until I can find something better. Hopefully I can find a, uh, or get some uh, piano wire or something to use as a more appropriate rod. Uh, so what I'm gonna do first is just kind of take the pad off and then just clean the key. Um, so with this older style of pads, um, generally with the more modern uh, pad cups, you, you kind of float the pad on a bed of glue um, you kind of do the same with these, except uh, because the pad, the pad doesn't like sit in anything. It just kind of sits on the key cup because it's not a modern uh, pad cup. It's more of like a like a dish shape. Um, so it's going to be a little bit different trying to get this pad seated, but uh, not too different. I should be able to do it. And hopefully this old pad will come off. There we go. Okay. All right, so I got that pad off. And this thing must, these must be the original pads from probably 100 years ago because they are just completely black, like rock hard leather. So, and that's kind of, uh, that's pretty typical actually with Targatos. Um, because of where they come from, like um, a lot of them ended up in Romania and just places where access to a like competent instrument repairman. It just wasn't available. So a lot of these just end up not getting repaired or if they do get repaired, they get kind of repaired pretty poorly. Um, so it's kind of one thing to keep in mind if you ever want to buy a Targato. A lot of them, uh, they have some, they may look okay in the pictures, but they have a lot of hidden problems that you might not have anticipated. Uh, so I'm just going to kind of go and um, I'm not going to polish these keys really just because um, these are, they do look like they're brass keys, but this is actually nickel. Um, once nickel has been tarnishing for this long, it, it turns this like gold color. And once it reaches this stage, it's very, very hard to polish them shiny. So generally, I just kind of like to leave them as is. Um, also, if I go polishing them, there's a risk of breaking them because, again, since it's such an old instrument, um, the metal wasn't as good as it is today. So there's potential for breaking keys, which I have done before. So I'm not going to risk it. I'm just going to kind of leave it as is. OK, so that key is pretty clean. Uh, let me just get my pad and then I want to start re it. And so the nice thing about Targatos is the, um, I can just use uh, the same basic leather clarinet pads that I normally use. So uh, let me just find a good size pad to you. I'm thinking it's about 16 millimeters. Let's see. So I'm just going to measure the, I'm not really going to measure it. I'm just going to kind of see. What it looks like 16 and a half millimeters is the correct pad size. So compare that to the existing pad. Yep, so those look pretty, pretty close. So I'm just gonna. Um, so I think the I'm not. I don't, I don't really work on instruments this old. Actually, I'm gonna go a little bit smaller guys. I don't really work on instruments this old usually. So uh, what I think I have to do is I just kind of have to make a mound of glue in the center of the the kind of dish, uh, and hopefully that'll hold the pad on properly. This paddle work. Okay, so. I'm just gonna kind of use some uh, some shellac. And I'm just gonna melt it in the dish, and then that'll hold the pad on. So I'll just kind of scoop some up. Okay. So now melt the glue. Okay. 
Okay. Put the pad on. Okay, one pad down. I'm just gonna make sure it's seated. And with this, uh, with this style of pad cup, there's the potential for the pad to kind of slip out the side. Um, it's kind of why we clarinets have moved to the more modern pad, uh, more modern pad cup style of uh, ease. But uh, I think that's that uh, looks pretty good. Okay, so there's one uh, pad down. Uh, unfortunately, it looks like the rest of these tone holes are pretty beat up. So I don't know if you can see, but it, there's just this instrument is just so. I can't tell if it's just because it's poorly manufactured, which it definitely is, but it just looks like it's also just beat to hell. Um, okay. Let's see, what can I fix next? So I've got... Okay, I think I have to do some more, um, some tone hole rebuilding. Uh, I don't think I'm gonna do that tonight just because I'm already kind of tired. Uh, I think actually I'm just trying to probably uh, call it quits for now. I don't really want to work on this instrument too much uh, when I'm tired, just because there's a lot more I have to do. Uh, so if anybody doesn't have any uh, last minute questions, I'm just going to get uh, just going to start to wrap up. So yeah, basically I just uh, today I don't really get a ton of work done, which is fine. Um, I know this instrument is probably going to be quite a big uh, project, just because there's so much that just needs attention on this instrument. Um, but yeah, I got one, one key repadded and got the socket fixed. And, uh, well, before that I fixed the, um, the cracks on this, the upper joints. So hopefully after a little bit more work, this instrument shouldn't be, um, at least playing. And then it's probably going to be a lot of tuning adjustments. Uh, obviously I have to make a few keys, but, uh, I think uh, after I'm done and after I do some adjustments, uh, and of course I got to add a register, uh, an octave event, I think this could be a fairly good playing instrument. Obviously it's not pretty, but if I get playing, that'll be nice. Um, see if there are any more questions. All right. Looks like we don't have any more questions. So, uh, thank you guys for joining me in the stream. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you kind of learned a little bit more about, uh, instrument repair. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to, uh, message me on Instagram. Um, Yeah, it's always awesome to see people. I love seeing people make their own homemade instruments because there's just so many cool things uh, that people who don't necessarily like work in instrument design think of. That you, you look at like instruments people make and say, hey, that's a really good idea. That's something clever that I didn't think about because generally when hobbyists make their own instruments, they're kind of thinking outside the box. So, yeah, if you guys want to build instruments, just go ahead and just try doing stuff because it's a, it's a very fun hobby. It's, it's really fun to do and it's very rewarding seeing playing an instrument and then saying you built this yourself. Uh, so yeah, good job, um, everyone. So hope you all had a uh, good stream. Hope you enjoyed it and have a wonderful night.